On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle, Community Alliance for Global Justice, and our friends at Elliott Bay Books, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our presentation with Tim Schwab, Ashley Fent, Dr. Stephen Gloyd, and Jesse Hagopian. Schwab's new book, The Bill Gates Problem, is the subject of tonight's talk. Well, thank you so much for coming. Um, we at EgerWatch, a program of Community Alliance for Global Justice, are so excited to welcome Tim Schwab to speak with us today about his new book, The Bill Gates Problem. Tim Schwab is an investigative journalist based in Washington, DC. His groundbreaking reporting on the Gates Foundation for the Nation, Columbia Journalism Review, and the British Medical Journal has been honored with an Izzy Award and a Deadline Club Award. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little bit about uh, AgriWatch and Community Alliance for Global Justice and the, the structure of tonight's event. Community Alliance for Global Justice is a Seattle-based organization that formed in 2001 to pursue just trade policies. It was founded by activists who had been involved in the WTO protests in Seattle to continue the fight against neoliberalism. <laughs> Um, in 2007, we shifted focus to, more, um, to focus more strongly on the intersections between trade and food sovereignty, connecting up local and international movements that were demanding more democratic food systems. As part of this work, we formed the AgriWatch program in 2008 out of a deep concern about the influence of the Gates Foundation on African agriculture. AGRA was created in 2006 by the Gates and Rockefeller Foundations to transform African agriculture under the flawed model of the Green Revolution, which aims to industrialize and privatize agriculture. The name AGRA um, originally stood for the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, but after long-running criticism of the organization and the Green Revolution itself, they dropped it from their name and now use AGRA as a standalone acronym. Even though AGRA was created by wealthy US foundations and is registered in Olympia for tax purposes, AGRA has branded itself as um, quote unquote African um, and has mobilized numerous governments, including the US, to invest taxpayer money in its initiatives. So we started this campaign to raise local awareness about the problems with what the Gates Foundation was doing in Africa. Um, over the years, we've partnered closely with African farmers movements, including the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, the continent's largest civil society movement, representing over 200 million small-scale food producers. We are proud to be a member of AFSA and partner with them in our campaigns and projects, including our short film series, Rich Appetites, How Big Philanthropy is Shaping the Future of Food in Africa. We have closely followed Tim's reporting on the Gates Foundation um, and have read and cited many of his articles in The Nation, so we are so excited to see this culmination of his work in print, and we hope that it begins to shift the tides in more critical portrayals of the highly undemocratic work of the Gates Foundation and its unearned power in shaping local and global priorities. Tonight, we'll interview Tim about the book, and then we will open the stage to discussants who are active in the sectors that Gates' work touches, education, public health, and agriculture. And we'll ask these discussants to comment on how Tim's findings connect to their own experiences and work. We'll then open it up to questions from all of you. Um, we ask you to submit online. There's a QR code um, that will pop up that you can use your phone and, um, you know, there, there it is. Um, so you can take, kind of go into your photos, take, um, you know, hold your phone up, and it'll take you to the link where you can load uh, or post your question. Um, if you have any trouble doing that or need help um, or uncomfortable doing that, when we get to the Q&A, you can just kind of raise your hand and we'll have someone who can go around and we'll do our best to accommodate you. Um, so now let's jump in to hear from Tim about his book. Um, Thank you again so much, Tim, for joining us um, all the way out here in Seattle. So for those who may not have read the book yet, um, can you tell us what is the Bill Gates problem? Thank you for having me, and thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. <clears throat> so the Bill Gates problem, it really boils down to extreme wealth and inequality. When we allow people to become this obscenely wealthy as Bill Gates is, last I checked, his estimated wealth was $120 billion. And that's more money than he needs, more money than he can spend on himself. So 
when we allow people to become this wealthy, we know how they'll use their money, which is for political purposes. This is how money in politics works, if not through campaign contributions, if not through lobbying, then through philanthropy. And that's what I'm arguing in this book, is that in the hands of someone like Bill Gates, philanthropy is another tool in the billionaire's toolbox to, to gain influence. It's not so much uh, making charitable donations as it is buying influence. Um, the Gates Foundation today, Bill and Melinda Gates, they'll fly all over the world meeting with elected leaders, shaping government priorities and government spending. Billions of dollars, public funds are flowing into the Gates Foundation's charitable projects. Um, the lives of billions of people are of shaped today by the work of the Gates Foundation, as are the bottom lines of major multinational companies with whom the Gates Foundation works. Every year, Forbes puts out a list of the 10 most powerful people in the world, and they almost always have Bill Gates on that list. Um, so he is a very powerful, not just a very wealthy, but a very powerful, powerful person. It's not just me saying this. And the Gates Foundation is a very powerful organization that needs to be held accountable. And can you tell us what compelled you to start investigating the Gates Foundation in the first place and then ultimately to write this book? I forgot to mention one thing, <laughs> which is that this book is about Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation, but it's also a case study. Um, Hundreds of other multi-billionaires have said they're going to follow Bill Gates' footsteps into philanthropy. They've pledged to give most of their money away. So the prospect of hundreds of billions of dollars, or maybe a trillion dollars, coming down the pike from the Mark Zuckerbergs and the Jeff Bezos of the world, is that cause for celebration or if, is that cause for concern? What it portends is a future, a political future, in which climate policy, public health, public education, how we regulate artificial intelligence is increasingly going to be the province of a small group of super rich individuals from the technology sector. Um, so the question was, why did I get interested in this book? Um, so I come to this book not as a scholar, but as a journalist. And the job of journalism, that's what they teach you in journalism school, is to afflict the comforted and comfort the afflicted. So if that is your job, to afflict the comforted, then Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation should be among the most challenged, most scrutinized individuals and institutions in the world, but they're not. Um, the news media is a very big character in this book because I don't feel that journalists have really done a great job the prevailing news coverage of the Gates Foundation tends to report on it in a one-sided manner. Um, they report on the Foundation's big donations, its grand ambitions, and its big goals for what it wants to accomplish. But seldom, I'm not going to say never, but seldom do journalists in the here and now say, well, is it really Bill Gates' job to reorganize agricultural development in Africa? Um, who elected him to do this work? What mandate does he have? Who's holding him accountable? Or on the back end, you could, you could do the accountability journalism to look back and say, what did the Gates Foundation promise? What did they hope to achieve? And what have they actually achieved? So in many ways, that's what my book is doing, is trying to fill in that void, that vacuum, um, where we haven't really done a lot of critical reporting, looking at the Gates Foundation as a structure of power. Thank you. And um, as a journalist, you talk about in the book the difficulties that you had following the money and also the difficulties of getting anyone at the Gates Foundation or many of their grantees to actually agree to talk to you. Um, could you tell us about that? Yeah, the foundation talks a big game about transparency, and it even goes so far as to justify or rationalize its political power by saying that it's transparent. Um, there was a quote Melinda French Gates gave a number of years ago in which she said, she acknowledged that it's unfair that the foundation exercises undemocratic power in the way that it does, that it can call elected leaders and elected leaders will pick up the phone, that it can go into poor school districts with their own ideas and their own agenda and money on the table and school districts will be inclined to follow the Gates Foundation's ideas. But, Melinda French Gates said, that exercise of power is justified because the foundation is transparent, because it has no secrets, because you can ask it questions, you can follow the money. 
Um, if you go to the Gates Foundation's headquarters, it's the steel and glass structure, and the foundation makes a big show of the fact that it's glass in order to telegraph the foundation's institutional values of transparency. So there's a lot of kind of front staging and PR about the transparency of the Gates Foundation, but in reality, it is a deeply non-transparent, and I would say deeply secretive um, organization. And of course, that's a problem because it makes it difficult to do something simple like follow the money and to be able to hold it accountable. Um, so you can see the lack of transparency through a number of different lenses. Um, every year around this time, the foundation publishes its IRS, its annual tax filings. It doesn't do this because it's a transparent organization, it's doing that because it is required to do so, to make these public. And so you have thousands of pages of these tax filings and they reveal a great deal and they can be a gold mine for a journalist or a researcher or somebody who's interested in taking the time to look through it. You can find in these documents the top salaries at the Gates Foundation. Many people are making a million dollars there. You can find all the charitable donations the foundation's given away and you can find where the Gates Foundation invests its $67 billion endowment. So there's a great deal we can learn from these documents, but there's also a great deal missing. Um, and you know, in my reporting, one of the things I did was look at every charitable grant the Gates Foundation had ever given away. And it's more than 30,000 grants at this point. And, but as you do this reporting, you continually find discrepancies where organizations will claim on their website that they're funded by the Gates Foundation, but Gates will have no record of it or vice versa, that the Gates Foundation will have a record of giving a charitable grant to a news organization, and that news organization will report on the Gates Foundation without disclosing its ties to the Gates Foundation. So you come across these discrepancies again and again, and eventually you discover that there's a lot of missing money. Um, and I can get into the details if somebody wants to know uh, the, the finer details of it. But there's billions of dollars that the foundation is spending to advance its agenda and its priorities that we can't know the destination of the money. It's not disclosing the recipient of the funds. And if you can't do something as simple as follow the money, then it's really hard to draw a circle around its influence to know who is and who isn't funded by the Gates Foundation and how it's, the mechanics of its power, how it's actually exercising power. Um, there's a whole book in, uh, a whole chapter in the book on transparency. I think it's a really important theme to think about. You know, this is a tax privileged nonprofit humanitarian body. It sh we should have no trouble um, following the money at the Gates Foundation. We should be able to ask the Gates Foundation questions and they should, uh, they should be eager to respond. Um, before I published my first article about the Gates Foundation or established myself, as a journalist who would put a critical lens on the foundation, the foundation would never sit for an interview. Um, not Bill or Melinda Gates or anyone at the foundation would sit for an interview. I've talked to other academic scholars and journalists who have um, approached the Gates Foundation as investigators asking tough questions. And you know, not universally, but many of them have the same experience that the Gates Foundation isn't really willing to engage with critics with outside criticism, with critical perspectives, with people who are really um, challenging the logic of the foundation and how it operates. So, you know, it's not just me saying this. I think it's, it's fair to say that it is a deeply non-transparent organization, which of course, if you can't see what it's doing, you can't hold it accountable. And as you were tracking some of where that money goes and all of the contracts and agreements that the Gates Foundation has, um, you, in the book, talk about some of the massive conflicts of interest around pharmaceuticals and vaccines. Um, you state that the Gates Foundation, quote, is not just a friend to Big Pharma, it is Big Pharma, end quote, and that according to one source that you spoke to, quote, Bill Gates is actually trying to create the world's largest pharmaceutical company, end quote. And you back this up through detailed analyses of the foundation's manipulation of the market, its acquisition of intellectual property rights. Um, you know, can you explain this a little bit more? How does that work? Yeah, it is, um, it is stunning the level of influence that the Gates Foundation now exercises in private markets. Um, so the foundation is making charitable donations to private for-profit companies. It's providing seed money to create new startup companies. It's sitting on boards of directors of private companies. When it 
makes charitable engagements with private companies. It, um, it has a licensing agreement that allow it to license the technology that these companies produce with the foundation's funding. So it's an extraordinary level of influence for a nonprofit philanthropy to have in private sector development. And where this gets difficult is, so the rationalization of it from the Gates Foundation's perspective is that the diseases it works on, for example, like malaria and tuberculosis, you can't, pharmaceutical companies can't make money producing drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, because who gets those diseases? Poor people. So this is a market failure. So the Gates Foundation says, well, it can step in and it can correct the market. It can help fund new TB drugs, new, a new malaria vaccine. Um, and it had big plans for these revolutionary new pharmaceuticals it was going to help develop. If you go back two decades ago to the beginning of the foundation, Gates promised that by this point we would have a very good vaccine for malaria, which we don't. Um, it promised you know, really game-changing innovations around tuberculosis drugs. So that's, that's a comment on the foundation's innovation agenda really hasn't paid off as it claimed. But to your question, um, it is a very blurry line between the Gates Foundation's nonprofit philanthropic activities and the for-profit private sector commercial activities in which it is deeply engaged. And where you start to think about who Bill Gates is, the guy who ran Microsoft, one of the world's most storied monopolies, and then you translate that into how Bill Gates runs the Gates Foundation, you know, the way the story has been told is that there's almost two different Bill Gates. There's this corporate bully who ran Microsoft, and now there's this kind-hearted, soft-spoken philanthropist who runs the Gates Foundation. It's a complete fiction. It's the same guy. He is the same hard-charging, bullying alpha male today that he was 40 years ago at Microsoft. And once you understand that, and you understand that the Gates Foundation makes a lot more sense, um, yeah, so the Gates Foundation's involvement with the private sector, I would just say that it hasn't really paid off like the Gates Foundation has claimed. It hasn't developed these revolutionary new drugs and di diagnostics and vaccines that have radically changed public health. And I think there are very serious questions to be raised about its level of influence in private markets. Um, yeah, I mean, very briefly, before I wrote the book, other researchers and journalists and scholars had observed the foundation's overlap with the private sector. One new thing that I did in the book is I actually reached out to private companies that have worked with the Gates Foundation. Um, and it's very interesting to hear their perspectives. Some of them talk about working with the Gates Foundation as essentially a corporate takeover, where the foundation is telling them who they can and can't hire in their own companies. They're setting the endpoints for clinical trials, which have major repercussions for the trajectory of their, their products that they're producing. Um, in some corners of pharmaceutical development, the Gates Foundation is funding competing companies. So many different companies working on the same kind of vaccine or drug or diagnostic. And that gives the foundation a great deal of influence over the development of an entire field uh, of a certain drug or, or pharmaceutical. So I think there's questions we should be raised about the propriety, the appropriateness of this activity, and also whether it's really, you know, is, is it, the big picture question is here, is this charity that's deserving of the massive tax benefits that the Gates Foundation gets, or is this really commercial activity that should be scrutinized the same way that we scrutinize big pharma, should be regulated, should be taxed? So speaking of taxes, um, in the book you talk about how a lot of these activities that the Gates Foundation is um, you know, donating toward, um, investing in, um, all of that is richly subsidized by taxpayers. So we're paying for it in, in various ways. Can you explain a little bit about how that works? It happens in a number of different ways. One is that Bill and Melinda French Gates, they donate money from their private wealth to their private foundation, where they continue to control how the money is spent. But in doing so, they've avoided a massive tax bill. Um, you know, the money that they, most of their money, of course, is invested in stocks and bonds, which would be subject to a capital gains tax. And when they die, it would be subject to an estate tax. So they're avoiding billions of dollars than taxes that they would otherwise pay by donating 
the money or the funds or the stocks or the bonds to the Gates Foundation. And tax scholars widely describe this as a tax subsidy, that the Gates Foundation is spending our money, so we should have some, that should be a trigger for accountability. We should have some say in how the money is spent, some transparency around the money, some checks and balance, or maybe we should get some credit for any good deed done with the money. That's one of several tax benefits. Once, once that money is in the Gates Foundation's bank account, which today is $67 billion, that money is invested into anything and everything. Um, over the years, journalists and scholars have pointed to it having investment in pharmaceutical companies, in fossil fuels, in arms manufacturers, agrochemical companies. And so the foundation most years is generating billions of dollars in revenue. It's, in some respects, you could just look at it as a huge investment bank. Um, that billions of dollars in revenue is currently subject to 1.39% tax. So it's essentially tax-free revenue. So that's another major tax saving tax benefit. And then lastly, much of the Gates Foundation's charitable work is organized as public-private partnerships, which are heavily, very heavily funded by us, um, taxpayers, the public. Um, yeah. Yeah, and um, I think, you know, as I was reading your book, I found it really interesting how Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation kind of continually transcend scrutiny. So you cite journalists, academics, and many others who have at various stages of Gates' career tried to bring attention to his abuses of power, all the way from the Microsoft antitrust case to the Epstein scandal. Um, but he always somehow manages to come out unscathed. Could you tell us about why that is and if you think that we're now seeing kind of a change in public perception of Gates and the Gates Foundation? Um, I do think that Bill Gates has reached the very zenith of his philanthropic career, and right now, I think he definitely took a hit on the world stage, his moral authority, in with the divorce from Melinda, the many allegations about misconduct, um, which Bill Gates denies. Um, there were allegations about misconduct with female subordinates at both Microsoft and the Gates Foundation. Bill Gates denies this. And a very hard to explain relationship with Jeffrey Epstein. All of these stories, these kind of personal scandal stories came out in succession and I think that did diminish his moral authority on the, on the global stage. At the same time, the Gates Foundation is getting bigger and bigger. Right now, it's $67 billion. Next year, it'll be even higher, I'm sure. And as long as the Gates Foundation's checkbook is open, I think many people are persuaded by a kind of ends justifies the means rationale. You know, thinking, well, thinking of all the good that can be done with this money and overlooking the flaws of this man or criticisms of the undemocratic way that it exercises power. I just think that when you exercise power through philanthropy, it's sort of a circuit breaker for our cognition, if not also our humanity because it really is hard to understand that this isn't just donating money, it's buying influence, that it's another tool of political influence. So I think that's all of that is part of it. I mean, there, there's so many reasons. You know, the foundation puts so much money into academic research, into journalism, all of which, again, I, would, I think it's fair to say buys a certain level of influence it helps the Gates Foundation write its own narrative. It shapes what we know about the Gates Foundation and how we think about it. So it has this incredible PR firepower, this epistemic power to, to, to shape how we think about it. Um, and it's hard to overstate how powerful that is, but I think there's many reasons. I, but yeah, I, I do think that the tide is turning. Like I'm hopeful, like Bill Gates, I'm an impatient optimist. I look at these political and social movements from Occupy Wall Street to Black Lives Matter to decolonize global health, and you see the world is turning, and it's not turning in Bill Gates' favor. I think the era right now, it's popular to, it's, um, you know, to ask somebody, should billionaires exist? That's a mainstream political question happening right now. So I do think the tide is turning against Bill Gates and what he represents and the model of power that he exercises. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Great, I mean, I hope so also. Um, my last question for you before we bring up others onto the stage is, 
Um, you mentioned just a minute ago around kind of all the good that can be done with that money. And I think, you know, a lot of people often think, well, you know, they spend, the Gates Foundation spends a lot of money. Gates could be doing way worse stuff with his money. You know, isn't this a good thing that they're at least doing something? Um, and in the book, you talk about um, the kind of lives saved rhetoric that the Gates Foundation themselves puts out around, you know, how many lives all of their investments have saved, even if there are some problems or some failures. Could you tell us a little bit about your position on that? Kind of, you know, does the, the good outweigh, or, you know, how, how could the good outweigh the bad? Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so at this point, the foundation has pledged $80 billion in charitable giving. And of course, people have been helped in some places and sometimes by this funding. And of course, this money could help other people. And it's very easy to get drawn into this idea that what's wrong with Bill Gates fighting malaria? Isn't he giving away donations, helping poor people go get donations? Isn't that saving lives? And of course it is, but only through a very superficial analysis that doesn't consider the counterfactuals, that doesn't examine the opportunity costs and the collateral damage that come with the Gates Foundation's power. So if you think about, I mean, and you could take, this is the strongest example. We'll hear later in the, in the panel from, from, about Gates' work in agriculture and education, which I think they have way more misses than hits. But if you look at the strongest example from the Gates Foundation is its work in public health, global health, which means public health for poor people. Um, the foundation is doing things like delivering vaccines, and vaccines do save lives. They prevent disease. They improve lives. But that's not the totality of public health. Pharmaceuticals is not the entire shebang, but that's Bill Gates' idea of public health, is delivering pharmaceuticals. Or that's certainly the priority of the Gates Foundation. And in the book, I talk to people at fancy institutions with fancy degrees that say that Gates' narrow focus on pharmaceuticals, on biomedical technology, is doing more harm than good. Um, I mean, if you think about a given disease, and you think about the, or think really broadly about public health or any public policy, you want these organized in it through a public process and democratic decision making. And what Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation can do is, as private actors, is as a private foundation, um, tip the scales of democracy in favor of his own narrow idea about how to approach any given public policy. So within public health, it's, it's not just, it has to be a more complex analysis than just vaccines out, lives saved, which is sort of the way that the Gates Foundation reduces things. You know, there are non-pharmaceutical approaches to diseases that involve, you know, building clinics, training doctors, building roads to help people get to clinics, building up health systems. Even within a pharmaceutical focused approach, which is the sort of Bill Gates approach, you could work with the pharmaceutical companies, which is what the Gates Foundation does, partnering with them on humanitarian projects, or you could challenge pharmaceutical companies. You could shame and embarrass them for having these vaccines and drugs that right now could be saving lives, but that are inaccessible because they're so expensive. You know, and there are so many, through this decision tree where you're looking at just this one area about public health of all the different places where democracy should be at play, and where the Gates Foundation can act in an undemocratic way to shape priorities and shape agenda. So I think at the end of the day, that's how we really have to think about this, as the Gates Foundation being a political organization that is fundamentally an anti-democratic organization. And it's not that we should criticize it or oppose it, or oppose it simply because it's anti-democratic, but also because it's not particularly effective or efficient. Yes, the Gates Foundation is helping get vaccines into the arms of the global poor, but there are arguably far more efficient and effective ways to do that, like challenging um, the big pharmaceutical companies that have patented monopoly control over these, that refuse to share their vaccine technology. Thank you. So I'd like to invite um, Stephen Gloyd and Jesse Hagopian to join us on stage. Um, Jesse Hagopian, here, um, has a long career in education, having taught for over a decade at Seattle's Garfield High School. 
Um, he is an organizer with the Black Lives Matter at School Movement and editor, an editor of Rethinking Schools. Um, Stephen Gloyd, to my left, um, is a family practice physician who has been a University of Washington faculty member since 1985 and has worked for over 30 years in Africa, Latin America, and Asia on various public health issues. So we'll start with you, Jesse. Thank you for joining us today. Um, could you share with us what Gates' impact has been on teachers and how he's worked around teachers instead of with them? Yeah, absolutely. Thank, thanks for the introduction. And, and Tim, congratulations on just such an important book. You know, as someone who spent uh, a lot of my life trying to fight against everything Bill Gates has done, uh, it's incredible to, to hear this analysis being put together with all the different tentacles he has around so many aspects of, of public life that he's strangling. So this is such an important book and I, I wish you all the best on, on the book tour and, and uh, getting this information into people's hands because I think once people understand just how destructive a force the Gates Foundation has been, it will really help empower us to organize a struggle for democracy because I think perhaps no single force in America has been more destructive for public education than Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation. Uh, they've spent billions of dollars on education, but not to ensure that every classroom has a nurse, something that we don't have here in Seattle, right? Every school does not have a nurse every day during a global pandemic. <laughs> So if you wanted to make a public health intervention and an education intervention, that would be the obvious, the, the very first thing if that's what you really cared about, right? He hasn't spent this billions of dollars to give us school psychologists in a time when mental health uh, of our young people is, is de deteriorating dramatically. He hasn't spent it to lower class size or to deliver culturally relevant or anti-racist curriculum. He's been glaringly, right, deafeningly silent on this whole banning of critical race theory, a banning of anti-racist education all across the country. Someone who's been so uh, talkative about education year after year after year is suddenly silent when a law is passed in Florida that makes it a felony, a five-year jail sentence, if you get caught with the wrong book about race or gender in your classroom, right? The official curriculum in Florida says that slavery was, quote, of personal benefit to black people. The official state curriculum, and yet Bill Gates, who has been involved in, every, in education debate for, for, you know, decades now, uh, has nothing to say about that. So his billions has actually been invested uh, into education policy, right? And towards a very narrow set of policies that favor uh, the free market, that favor privatization, that favor private uh, corporations. And after his many decades of investing these billions of dollars, they kind of shrugged and said, well, you know what, it didn't work. They admit, <laughs> the Gates Foundation, Bill and Melinda, they admit it really hasn't helped the children they thought it, it would help. Uh, and we've been saying that all along, that it, far from just not helping, it's, it's been destructive. And I just want to highlight uh, a couple of areas where it's been most destructive. The first is his obsession with high-stakes standardized testing. Right, He said we need to measure teachers by the, by the scores of their students, which led to this massive shaming and blaming of teachers for the underfunded schools in our country. Uh, he helped to fund the Race to the Top initiative that wanted to tie teachers' pay to test scores, uh, and states that would do that then got financial incentives, right? And because of Gates's work, the average student now in the United States takes an outlandish 112 high-stakes standardized tests during their K-12 career. You know, I took one in third grade, then took one 
in middle school, then took a couple in high school, right? Today's students are taking them like every month, these, these scores that are being used to label shame and uh, sometimes are tied to very high stakes, like even regardless of your GPA, not being able to graduate because of one test, right? Uh, and I would just say that the same kind of logic that underpins the idea that high stakes standardized testing would somehow usher in an era of uh, quality education is the same kind of thinking that you'd have to have if you found a child in the Arctic Ocean, you pull them out of the ocean, and then you begin to take their temperature. And then you take their temperature again and again, and then you take it again, and you take it 112 times before you decide that something needs to be done. Conversely, educators say if you pull that child out of the Arctic Ocean, you would need to dry them off and wrap them, around, wrap them with a blanket. Or if the analogous situation in schools, provide wraparound services, the health care, the psychologists, right, the after-school tutoring, the mentor programs that we know are what it takes to, to support children, right? These are the things that he won't invest in. Instead, he's invested his money into charter schools, right, which is about privatizing public education. His largest donation ever was to after voters in Washington state voted down charter schools over and then over again, uh, invested an immense amount of his largest donation ever to a campaign and just barely got it passed just over the 50% uh, margin. Uh, and this has been all about how do we get public taxpayer funds into private hands that run unaccountable charter schools that have been shown by many, many studies to not outperform public schools in any measure. In fact, they're more segregated and have uh, more disproportionate discipline against black and brown children. And then finally, I'll just end with one of his greatest debacles, which was the Common Core State Standard Initiative that he bankrolled to try to strong arm uh, every state in the nation to adopt a, a common set of standards, believing that, that that would usher in this new age uh, of educational quality. And I just want to read to you a quote from Bill Gates that uh, explains his thinking of why this would be the silver bullet for education. Uh, he, th he said that standardization was especially important to allow for innovation in the classroom because, quote, if you have 50 different plug types, appliances wouldn't be available and would be very expensive, right? But once an electric outlet becomes standardized, many companies can design appliances and competition ensues, creating a variety of better prices for consumers, right? A brilliant analysis if our children were toasters. <laughs> But our children are human beings, and they need love, and they need support, and they need mentors, and they need to be in spaces that are beautiful uh, with uh, enough educators so that their needs can be seen. So I'll just say that, as you can tell from this quote, his goal is actually to create a market for more products, right? Tests, testing companies have become massive behemoths like Pearson making billions of dollars, privatized schools, standardized curriculum. It's all about opening up the market forces for more companies to profit off of education rather than support it. And students face many incredible challenges today. We definitely need to transform education because we know that we are living through an age of unprecedented income inequality, mass homelessness, houselessness everywhere. We have endless wars and genocide in the Middle East. We have the rights of women and LGBTQ plus people being eroded uh, 
all over the country. We have so many different cri- overlapping crises in our society. And I would submit to you that none of those problems can be solved by bubbling in A, B, C, or D. We have to develop critical thinking in the classroom and civic courage and imagination and curiosity and creativity if we're going to be able to raise a generation of people that can organize collectively to meet the real challenges that we face in the world today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse, for your commentary and for your tireless work in this battle as an educator and an activist. Um, and we will come back to here in the kind of take action closing se- section of the um, presentation today about kind of what you, could, what you all can do um, to support some of the efforts led by educators in this, in this movement. Um, I'd like to turn it over to you, Steve. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Could you tell us about how the Gates Foundation has impacted public health and how um, its funding has shaped what researchers can and can't do in your field? Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Um, First of all, big thanks and congratulations to you, Tim, for uh, a book that I think will hopefully change people's ideas and minds about the way not just Bill Gates works, but the way billionaire philanthropy works. And also, Jesse, thank you for your comments about how we need to change schools. It's great. Uh, What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how I and the the public health world that I inhabit has been affected by the Gates Foundation over the past couple of decades. Um, What's great is what Tim has written in the book is about two-thirds about my experiences, so I was able to sort of relive them as I was going through the book. But the first thing I think is important to say is that, you know, the Gates Foundation has been very generous um, to the University of Washington, uh, to me in terms of, you know, some grants that I've got from the foundation. Um, And that's very much part of what you you say about the way that they do work, is that they are generous, they do make people reluctant to go against, you know, what the foundation is doing. they built a couple, like four buildings on campus that are state-of-the-art, beautiful buildings. My office is in one of them. Um, they have these uh, projects that help fund students. Uh, they fund faculty members. So people tend to be kind of indebted to the foundation. Um, most of the funding goes to disease-specific interventions, as, um, as Tim, you've said. Uh, vaccine, drugs, you know, diagnostics, family planning, preventive strategies, that, all that kind of stuff. But the fact is, the health systems in most um, what are called resource-poor countries um, are as a result of two to three decades uh, of austerity policies um, pushed and imposed by the global north and the global south Um, that they really don't have, to a large extent, the capacity to even use these new interventions that the Gates Foundation is producing. Um, So they're doing some great work. You know, it's great to have new vaccines. It's great to have new uh, diagnostics. And in fact, the people who work at the Gates Foundation, everybody I know who works there, they're great. You know, they're really good good folks. Um, I think the problem is, as you've stated, is the leadership of the foundation and how it obstructs and subverts some of the issues that are really critical in global health. Um, One of those is the whole idea of the social determinants of health, and you've talked about that. Um, If you look at what really is important for health, population health in the world, um, it's education, nutrition, family income, housing, water, sanitation, and healthcare. And healthcare is kind of you know, near the bottom of that list in terms of its effectiveness. And if you look at actually the studies that have been done, including by people who work with the Gates Foundation, that over 50% of all childhood mortality, which is a good indicator of population health, is attributed to education alone, just education alone. Um, malnutrition is associated with at least half of childhood deaths. 
And the medical care stuff that is done by the Gates Foundation probably could, you know, amount to maybe a quarter to a third of all the changes or the improvements that we have in mortality. And so it's strange to me that the foundation, in its efforts to improve population health, is ignoring those absolutely essential issues. And if you go to the foundation and say, listen, I'd like to look at, you know, the influence of of education or nutrition or some of these other uh, um, social political dynamics on global health, you'll get a pretty cold shoulder. Um, if you look at health systems, and we've done this, um, Amy Hagopians in the audience who has gone to the foundation a couple of times and has tried to get them interested in the fact that these health systems that are responsible for getting the vaccines that the Gates Foundation is making are short in Africa alone of about a million health workers. Um, so a group of Malawians uh, gave a presentation recently saying that over 50% of their health facilities nationwide have vacancies, not have vacancies, are vacant, the positions are vacant, uh, because they can't afford to pay the health workers what they need to get paid. And yet uh, the Gates Foundation wasn't interested in looking at either health workforce or the resource scarcity that is one of the drivers of health work workforce problems. And the whole idea of resource scarcity is something that is kind of a myth because most countries actually have, you know, poor countries, low middle income countries, have plenty of resources, um, but they don't necessarily have taxation systems that bring out the kinds of resources they need. They allow uh, capital flight, they allow, um, uh, 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 tax evasion or uh, tax avoidance uh, and one of the major sources of that tax evasion and, and avoidance is the enabling that occurs right here in this country. As a matter of fact, the, the number one uh, tax secret haven in the world is the United States uh, because of the laws of North Dakota or Delaware or, or Nevada. So. Those are the kinds of things that make a huge difference in the ability to address some of the issues in global health, whether it's the social determinants of health or whether it's the health systems, and yet there's no effort on the, on the, the part of the foundation to really look at those issues, which it could well do. But it's, it's not really uh, clear that they even have the mandate to do that because I think, as, as you've said, Tim, this is not really where they're going anyway. It's, it's, there's a, a different agenda of the, of the foundation. It is interesting, though, that in a book on global, on a book on Gates, where you discuss global health, you're one of the first people who has talked about the importance of taxation in global health. It's just fundamental. You've got, you know, taxation is important for education as well, fair taxation, and yet that's one of the things that the Gates Foundation or Bill Gates is not particularly interested in because he's gained a great deal of his wealth through unfair taxation practices. And then there's finally the issue of patents. Um, and you've talked a great deal about patents and the fact that um, that Bill is pretty ex obsessed with, with patents. Um, and um, let me just share a story that came about um, from the Global Fund uh, for AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, which the Gates Foundation actually had a substantial role in funding uh, in the first couple of years and still funds quite um, uh, generously. Um, the Global Fund came about at a time when the AIDS epidemic in this country was transformed by the advent of triple therapy. Uh, three drugs that would be taken at once, uh, which essentially took the mortality of what was 100% mortality, that is everybody who got HIV pretty much died after a period of time, to very low levels of mortality, but it cost $50 a day. And people in the, in the global south couldn't afford it. Um, and a, uh, in 2000, 2001, an Indian pharmaceutical company called Cipla came up with a combination drug of all three drugs in one pill that would be taken twice a day uh, that cost $1 a day just by making it a generic. And that suddenly made it possible to conceive of the fact that you could treat everybody in the world who was at that point dying of AIDS. And when I was working in Mozambique at that time, about one third of the population was infected with HIV, which meant a death sentence for everybody. Um, and 
with the global fund coming about, the global fund essentially was, it came about because of the pressure of lots of non-governmental organizations and other groups that were forcing governments to say, listen, we can treat it, it's time to treat it, let's make sure that the resources are available. Global fund comes about, a bunch of countries develop programs to start treating these folks with HIV who would otherwise be dying in a couple of years, and the Gates Foundation representative on the board decided to push preventive care and was absolutely against treatment for a very large number of countries, including Mozambique, where I'd worked. And the Mozambique rep to this group basically told me that they had a very well-developed plan for universal treatment of HIV, and it was completely nixed by the Gates representation and the Global Fund because they had so much influence. I was pretty upset about that, and so I called the Gates Foundation head at that point, a guy who was uh, a personal friend, and I asked him, you know, what was going on here? You know, why would the Gates Foundation, when the money exists, when the drugs exist, you know, why would they go against uh, a, a country that had a very viable plan for universal treatment? And his response was very quick, and he said, Bill has an absolute resistance to any infringements on patents. And my personal estimate, which is just a guesstimate over the influence of that particular decision, was that somewhere in the hundreds of thousands or millions of people didn't uh, make it through that year until finally things changed and treatment was available. So what Bill Gates does in terms of his policy making on the basis of the fact that he has so much leverage and so much power and so many organizations has real effects that um, make a difference. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> so um, I had hoped to be able to turn over um, the mic to Daniel to, to talk about um, the impact on agriculture. But um, since he isn't able to make it, I'll just briefly kind of touch on how we see some of these very similar kinds of discussions and, and problems happening in the Gates Foundation's funding of agricultural development um, per, with particular focus on the African continent. Um, so much like um, you know, others have noted um, with public health and with education, the Gates Foundation has really um, fully gone into funding a model of, of agriculture that is not evidence-based, that is highly problematic, and that is very, very top-down um, and heavy on kind of the role of corporations, the private sector, patents. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the Gates Foundation started um, AGRA in 2006 with the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, the whole idea was around the need to like transform African agriculture. And if you look at some of the early marketing materials, they have these like, you know, super high budget, beautiful looking um, ads, you know, videos that they put out um, where they basically kind of show, you know, women in Africa with a hoe um, talking about the drudgery of it, right? And how they need, you know, better science, they need better seeds. Um, and how the Gates Foundation and AGRA are going to come in and provide that. Um, and this is the same kind of rhetoric that they've used consistently, this idea that there's something wrong with African agriculture that is the fault of farmers not knowing any better, um, not knowing what they're supposed to do, having bad seeds, um, and that they then need to kind of come in and, and solve that problem. And the way that they've solved that problem, you know, quote unquote, solve the problem, is through partnerships with companies like Monsanto, um, like John Deere, right? Um, companies that are heavily invested, and of course Monsanto is now owned by Bayer, right? So now many of their, their um, programs are with Bayer instead. Um, but the whole model is around um, essentially using AGRA and using many of the Gates Foundation's other you know, grantees in the agricultural space in Africa um, to open up markets for foreign agribusiness corporations, to be able to sell patented seeds, to be able to sell fertil increased fertilizer use, um, even as you know, the rest of the world is trying to move away from fertilizers because we know the horrible impacts that they've had on um, our soils, on, on the climate, right? Um, 
And so what a lot of these institutions um, have done, they've, they've, they've abjectly failed to actually improve productivity, to increase farmer incomes, as was promised. Um, what they have succeeded in, though, is getting African governments to pass laws um, that, for example, um, open up seed markets to private corporations um, and kind of eliminate protections for farmer-managed seed systems, for seed saving, for seed diversity. Um, and so this is kind of the, the pattern that we've seen happening in a lot of different forums. And the particularly egregious thing, I mean, there are many egregious things, but one of the particularly egregious things about this is that um, the Gates Foundation has been able to do this by presenting AGRA as, as African. Um, and initially, the board of AGRA was majority not African. Um, and to the, still, none of them are farmers. Um, but what they've done, they've brought more Africans onto the board. They have it based in Kenya. Um, they have basically, you know, tried, they've, they do hire African staff, right? And so in doing that, they've created this um, central vehicle for organizations like um, the U.S. Agency for International Development, for, you know, the German Development Agency, for, for governments to channel their money into this kind of central or the central organization ostensibly you know, to benefit Africa um, at the same time that it's undermining local organizations within Africa that have their own solutions and their own models of what they're demanding and what they know that they need for, for agriculture to, you know, to, to work into the future. Um, and just to kind of you know, make one point also on this note is that um, I, I come to this as, um, you know, having been involved in AgriWatch, but also having training um, in African history and having spent a lot of time doing research in West Africa. And so when I um, was reading this book, I was kind of struck by some interesting historical parallels. So in the 1870s, um, there was a proposal to basically have this amazing humanitarian um, colony in the center of Africa. And this colony was going to be a free trade area where all countries could come and they could, you know, you know trade freely. Um, and many countries around the world, leaders, even journalists of the time, ate it up. This was, this was great. Um, this colony promised to end slavery. It was doing all of this wonderful stuff. Um, that colony, of course, was the Congo. It was um, subject to enormous amounts of brutality and violence um, by King Leopold, who basically governed it as his own private colony. And I'm not saying, just to be clear, I'm not saying that Bill Gates is a mass murderer. Um, but what I am saying is that there are often terrible things and very deeply problematic colonial violent things that happen under the guise of humanitarianism, particularly if we don't interrogate it. And so I think that, you know, much as what happened in that instance, there were journalists, there were people, you know, investigators, auditors who actually went on the ground, looked at what was happening and exposed it for what it was. Um, and I think that that is so important that and I see that happening in this book, is that we're, we're confronting Bill Gates's power, we're confronting the power of the Gates Foundation, and we're interrogating what actually is happening. Um, and in many cases, it is a deeply colonial, um, neo-colonial uh, model of quote-unquote development um, that just kind of reproduces many of the same structures that have led to impoverishment in much of the world, and, you know, in fact, like, exacerbates many of those processes through monopoly capitalism, patenting, um, you know, uh, manipulation of government laws. So um, we would love to now um, open it up to um, the questions from all of you um, for Tim about the book specifically or to any of the panelists. Um, now that the lights have dimmed, I can kind of see people. This is great. Um, so the um, QR code is up there, and I have one question um, 
that I can start with. So I think this is a question for Tim. Um, have you spoken with Drs. Victoria Hale and Avi Herskovitz of the Institute for One World Health, the first nonprofit drug development company, which was first funded by Gates, then taken over and eventually dissolved by Gates? <laughs> Great lead. No, I haven't talked to them. Um, I mean, it's writing this book was so challenging because you know the Gates Foundation has been up and about for more than two decades now, and they work on everything. So you know, there's a chapter on agriculture, there's a chapter on education, there's chapters on public health, um, there's chapter on family planning and contraceptive access. So um, one book can't tell the whole story. This sounds like a juicy lead. We should talk afterwards and um, figure this out. Okay. Um, here's another one. I believe this is also for you, Tim. Um, does your analysis extend to the Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, Seattle Foundation, and others? <laughs> another question that I have to decline. No, it doesn't. Um, I mean, no, it does. It really doesn't. It's looking at the Gates Foundation and. Um, kind of on its own. It's not getting into the historical antecedents. I mean, I, I do a little bit at times and places, you know, with family planning, you can look at the historic efforts of American foundations um, with the ag work in agriculture, the Green Revolution, you can go back to the original Green Revolution, again, funded by American foundations. So there's some of that reporting in the book, um, but it's not, certainly not a focus of it. Um. Could you explain how a nonprofit is able to invest in so many for-profit companies? What's the loophole in our tax law that allows this? Um, again, you know, the Gates Foundation would, I think, be baffled by this question because they said, you know, well, we're going to help private for-profit companies develop new life-saving vaccines that otherwise wouldn't be developed. You know, um, Pharmaceutical companies, other investors aren't going to put money into a malaria vaccine that is going to be used on poor people that can't afford to buy it. So from the Gates Foundation's perspective, this is charity. This is a charitable gift. This is philanthropy. Um, and, you know, there's a certain rationale there that, of what this is doing. But I nevertheless think it's certainly the scope and the scale and the level of involvement of the Gates Foundation in private industry with very little in the way of checks and balances. I think that bears scrutiny. Thank you. Um, what's surprising is that the Gates approach to charter schools, public health, agriculture, et cetera, is not evidence-based, contrary to the perception of the tech sector. How is that? Um, so maybe we could... Start with you, Tim, and then if Steve or Jesse have things to add from their perspectives. Yeah, I would say Steve and Jesse should take this one. Um, I'm thinking right now about Common Core evidence base, but uh, you can take it where you want to go. Sure. Um, it is really astounding to think that all the evidence has been clear in education, right? That the charter schools over and over again, year after year, the millions are flowing into starting new charter schools and the evidence year after year after year, even by their own flawed measure of standardized test scores that we reject as educators as being useful, but, but even by their measure, they're not raising the test scores, right? They're not increasing the graduation rates. They are increasing the segregation rates, the pushing out rates of black and brown kids, which was the opposite of what they said, right? And so it's clear that the evidence doesn't matter. And so then you have to look at the underlying problem, right? That I think you get at, you really get at, should billionaires exist, right? <laughs> and when, when you think about the fact that Gates identified, okay, the private sector isn't going to go in and help poor people, uh, and so we're going to have to step in and, and try to be a Band-Aid for that. Hold up. If, if all of corporations don't have an interest in helping poor people's health or education, then isn't there something fundamentally wrong with that economic system that we would actually need to, to look at people who are challenging an economic system built on inequality, built on... Uh, extracting wealth from working and, and poor people. But instead of drawing that conclusion, it's, well, I'm going to come in 
and be, be the savior with whatever plan that, that I, springs to my head at that moment, right? Whatever the latest fad is that I see and always driving the money towards the for-profit industries uh, because that's his, his worldview. So the evidence doesn't drive the decisions he makes. It is about a worldview about profit. Thank you. Can we hear from you, Steve? Is there some? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great question. And um, the health side, I think, is quite different than the education side <clears throat> because the foundation, Bill Gates himself, and particularly IHME, which you do a, a fantastic job, I think, of describing in the book, um, really pride themselves in the degree to which their health interventions are evidence-based. And um, the people who work at the foundation are quite uh, well-trained in the importance of scientific evidence. You know, they get a lot of their, um, their articles published in The Lancet. They seem to have a, a, a pretty nice conduit to The Lancet, of course. But um, it definitely is evidence-based. But then when it comes to actually making attributions of the influence of the foundation on, say, mortality rates or life expectancy, it's crazy. I mean, there's almost, it's almost like we're talking to two different kind of groups of people. You know, a bunch of PR folks whose job it is simply just to make graphs look nice so that there's an, an attribution of what Gates does to mortality, and the people who are in the foundation, whom I guess are probably scratching their heads and feeling a little bit queasy about the degree to which these attributions are made. Ashley, we have a question in the audience. Uh, Tim, you were on a program, Unheard, uh, interviewed by somebody in England last month, and she asked you point blank what the net impact of the Gates Foundation has been, positive or negative. Could you repeat or rethink your answer? Yeah, I mean, I think that on net, the Gates Foundation is doing more harm than good. I think that the single biggest beneficiary of the Gates Foundation is Bill Gates himself. Through the tax benefits he collects, the public applause, the awards, the political power, the influence, the Gates Foundation is not so much about the global poor making us pay attention to the global poor, it's making us pay attention to Bill Gates as a kind of savior for the global poor. So I mean, we've heard these testimonies today about its work in education, agriculture, and public health. You know, you could look at its strongest example, which I probably spend the most time in the book, its work on health, doing things like delivering vaccines, which do save lives. But I still think on the net, it's very clear that it's doing more harm than good. Um, here's another question. Um, is there, I think, I believe this is for you, Tim. Is there a connection between the Gates Foundation's philanthropic investments in the developing world and Bill Gates' personal investments in public corporations? I think there's certainly overlap in times and places, and it happens in maybe indirect ways, but maybe also direct ways. So we've talked about the Gates Foundation's enthusiasm for patents around pharmaceuticals. Well, those same patents and intellectual property concerns are the same sort of features that animated Microsoft's profits that continue to do so. So by supporting strong patent rights, intellectual property rights in the world of pharmaceuticals as a humanitarian philanthropy, it also gives a certain amount of political cover and defense, I think, for the patents and copyrights and intellectual property that um, Microsoft runs on. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's other ways, too. One of the Gates Foundation's first projects was, was working in libraries, and it was donating computers loaded with Microsoft software into libraries. You know, so there's a lot of ways people think of, some people, I guess, think of Microsoft as kind of a computer software company, but their work today in artificial intelligence and cloud computing, I mean, they're working on agriculture, they're working on public health. There's a lot of overlap between Microsoft and the Gates Foundation that I absolutely think bears scrutiny. I think that there's, there's times and places where it's hard to avoid seeing an overlap or a conflict of interest. And this is a, a kind of a more general question, so maybe we'll direct it to others first and then come back to you, Tim. Um, how could Gates Foundation funding be used more effectively? How can international institutions, NGOs, or social movements do development, quote unquote, development better than foundations? Um, so maybe... 
Steve or Jesse? You want to start? And I got some <laughs> ideas too, though. Well, um, first of all, it's a tough question to ask because the whole premise of the foundation, as I think you've pointed out pretty well, is problematic. And so, you know, how could you use that money better? I think might be a, you know, a, perhaps a better question. So that I'm going to ask that question or answer that question, which is um, that, you know, the, the big issues, and I'm going to focus on global health, are issues around poverty, disparity, exploitation, um, issues around north versus south, um, you know, uh, looting, if you will. Um, and those issues need to be addressed and looked at. And the Gates Foundation certainly is not going to do this because it's not in their interest to do this. But if there were a foundation that had that kind of money, um, I think it would be very worthwhile to try and understand ways of addressing some of the structural violence, if you want to call it, that exists today in the world, to try to understand the degree to which some countries have been able to address it and to identify you know, those best practices that could be used by others and maybe fund some organizations that are really challenging those structures. Um, it probably wouldn't cost nearly the amount of money that Gates is putting out, but it might have a much more profound effect. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if... If Bill Gates was actually interested in the problem of educational inequality or health inequality, um, there's a lot of immediate steps to take. I mean, you know our schools, how our schools are funded in the U.S., right? They're funded with property taxes so that people who live in wealthy areas, <laughs> surprise, surprise, their schools get more money, right? You fix that basic problem and you have an immense change for millions of kids, right? So the, if he was actually interested in helping millions of kids have better outcomes, he would be waging a campaign across America using his wealth to change tax structures, to tax the billionaires so that everybody got, gets the same education that he got at the elite private school that he went to here in Seattle, right? Uh, and, and so we know the, the types of interventions that would help uh, children. There, half of, almost half of kids in the U.S. Are, are food insecure, right? So we know that we have to change those tax structures and investments in our, in our youth if we're going to support them. I mean, when you have 40,000 kids who are houseless in, in Washington State, how can we ask them to do homework as educators when we have this gross level of inequality? And instead of attacking inequality, he attacks teachers and says that <laughs> teachers are the problem and we need to find the bad ones by looking at the test scores that aren't being raised. And then once we find a classroom with low test scores, then we can punish those teachers and, and students, right? Instead of how do we nurture them, how do we give them the resources they need, right? And I think that's the paradigm shift that, that we need to make. And it's not going to come from billionaires, spoiler alert. Uh, I've never seen a movement led by billionaires to give their wealth away and to empower uh, the rest of us to use that wealth to nurture young people, right? And it's going to be movements like the Occupy movement, like the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, like um, the many tens of thousands of people joining Democratic Socialists of America and uh, you know, fighting for a different kind of economic system. And just to add to that from the agriculture perspective, um, echoing what every, everyone else has said, right? Like the Gates Foundation is not, is not gonna pivot. It's not able to pivot. Um, and you know, there's fundamental problems with how it's structured and how it's set up. But just to name that like one of the calls that many African farmer movements um, and other 
farmer-based movements around the world are calling for is in more investment in agroecology, um, which basically would you know uses um, kind of biological methods to um, increase yields, restore soils, manage water use, right, without reliance on very expensive and volatile markets for fertilizers, pesticides, all these things, and has is evidence-based. There's increasing amounts of scientific evidence supporting that. But again, the Gates Foundation is not going to fund that. That's Most of that funding is coming from like progressive philanthropy, um, happening from grassroots movements and things like that because um, it's just not compatible with the Gates Foundation's strong commitment to um, patents and capitalism and, um, you know, enrichment of wealth, basically. Tim, did you have anything to add? Okay. Um, I think I, there's so many great questions. Let's do one more, um, and then we will invite others, you know, to... Stay, stick around and ask your questions. But um, so, Tim, why do you think the media has been historically complicit in valorizing Gates and the foundation, especially given the afflict the comfortable credo? Um, great question. Like I said, the news media is a central character in the book. I think there's a number of reasons. Um, you know, cynically, we could say the foundation is donating hundreds of millions of dollars to journalism putting money into newsrooms, newsrooms here in Seattle, newsrooms all over the globe. There are very few large mainstream newsrooms that are not touched by the Gates Foundation's funding. If they're not receiving funding, then their columnists have outside employment at a Gates-funded journalism program. So that's one reason, that's one important reason. Um, that's not the only reason, however. I think Gates, um, you know, there's a very attractive hero narrative where this guy, he made all this money, the richest guy in the world, now he's giving it all away. It's a fiction, but it's an attractive hero narrative that, you know, is, is, lends itself to the media. I think that the neoliberal sensibilities that Bill Gates brings to his philanthropic career, the market-based solutions, the primacy of the privatization, um, you know, corporate power, public-private partnerships. This has sort of been the water we've been swimming in for decades with the privatization of everything from municipal water supplies to um, prisons to space exploration now. So he has this kind of neoliberal sensibilities that for most of the tenure of his philanthropic career, it's sort of just chimed, I think, with the, this mainstream sensibility of the news media. Um, so I think there are a lot of reasons but I do think that, you know, if you're talking about is the Gates Foundation doing more harm than good, I think the, a really good case study is to look at the foundation's funding of the news media, which I think has just been really destructive to journalism, to independent journalism that has been able to do tough accountability reporting in the Gates Foundation. So I think that newsrooms, journalists should stop immediately taking funding from the Gates Foundation. And I think it's a lesson that a lot of other sectors could consider too. Like, you can say no to the Gates Foundation. Um, I mean, not everybody can at this point. There's kind of a level of dependency maybe, but it's something that we could be thinking about. Thank you, and that's a great segue into um, our kind of calls to action. So, um, you know, we've hopefully everyone is fired up and <laughs> mad about all of this, so what do we do about it? How do we solve the Bill Gates problem? Um, and Tim has kind of addressed, you know, some of that just now. Um, you hopefully have this flyer floating around. Um, if you don't, I think Heather can maybe distribute some. Um, and we're just going to kind of talk through a few things. So first of all, um, please get involved and follow um, AgriWatch. Um, you can follow our work. Um, in challenging the Gates Foundation and promoting um, agroecological alternatives in partnership with our African partners um, by signing up for our e-newsletter, um, which is on the flyer. Um, this is also all, by the way, if you, and it's hard, a little hard to read, there's a QR code here if you wanted to see it on the web. Um, we, uh, CAGJ, is a membership-based organization, um, so we would love for all of you to get involved as members. Um, this is super essential to making everything we do happen. Um, so to become a member, please donate or fill out our membership card at our table tonight, which is over there, right, Heather? It's, yep. Okay. Um, 
we also have a number of things you can do to take action in terms of fair taxation policies, which don't go all the way to solving the Bill, Bill Gates problem, but certainly are a step in the right direction. Um, in Washington State, there have been bills introduced in the State Senate and House to tax billionaires. Um, so you can send a comment to your senator and your rep about why these bills are so important. Um, the links and sample messages are in on this take action flyer. Um, at the same time, we also need federal legislation to reform the tax code and introduce billionaire wealth taxes. And proposals to tax billionaires have died out in Congress over the past few years. Um, not surprising given, you know, as Tim has noted, the like levels of political influence and lobbying that many billionaires have been able to do, including the Gates Foundation and Bill Gates. Um, so you can call or email your Congress people in DC to let them know that this still needs to be on their radar, even though in the current Congress, it probably won't go anywhere. Um, just to put this in context, corporations and billionaires, including um, Gates and the Gates Foundation, spend huge amounts of money and time meeting with politicians. In a lot of cases, they can just like call them up, get a meeting. Um, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and other tech billionaires met in September of this year with members of Congress in kind of closed door negotiations to discuss AI regulations, the same AI that they themselves are developing. So if we are ever gonna have policies that work for us and that protect us, we have to be dogged in um, basically, you know, hounding Congress, insisting that the people that we elected be accountable to us um, and not to billionaires who are just kind of able to call them up and throw a bunch of money at their campaigns. So we have to keep fighting to keep this on the table, to get it on the table. Um, so, you know, even though it's not likely this round, please do just keep, keep calling, keep emailing. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to talk also about um, what an action that you can take to demand investigation and oversight um, into the foundation. Tim? Yeah, so, I mean, the work of the Gates Foundation, is, it's incorporated as a private foundation in the United States. Um, it is subject to not a great many, but some rules and regulations. Congress hasn't looked at private philanthropy in more than 50 years. So philanthropy has changed a great deal in that time, so that Congress is long overdue to think about new rules and regulations. Um, interestingly, because the Gates Foundation is in Washington State, it's also subject to oversight by the Washington State Attorney General's office. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of questions, a lot of ways, and we've discussed them, that the Gates Foundation's work doesn't really seem to meet the common definition of charity. The Gates Foundation is donating $100 million to Lakeside School, this elite private school where the Gates children attended. How is that philanthropy? How is that charity, given that Gates children are going to this school? Um, you know, the way that the foundation interacts with the private sector. You know, there's certainly questions, enough questions to be raised about thinking about an investigation into the Gates Foundation's activities. Does this meet the common definition of charity? Is it deserving of the massive tax benefits and tax subsidies that we put into the Gates Foundation? There's a real accountability trigger here and we should be asking our elected representatives and people in power to be taking a close look at this issue. Thank you. Um, one other kind of tax related, taxpayer related um, initiative that you can take action on, um, AgriWatch and our partners have been leading a campaign for the past couple years to pressure the US Agency for International Development to stop using taxpayer dollars um, to fund the Gates Foundation's AGRA initiative, which we've kind of talked about today. Um, so there's a link um, on this, on the back of this one. Um, you can just go in there and it'll send an automated, automated email um, to USAID um, calling on them to stop funding AGRA. Um, and I'm going to um, end by turning it over to Jesse to share with us how people can support the opt-out movement. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think there are some really important ways that we can challenge Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation's education policy. And if you're an educator in the room, you can do what we did at Garfield High School, my alma mater, where I taught the last 10 years. And in 2013, we took a vote 
all the faculty decided we were going to collectively refuse to administer the MAP test. This is one of the 112 that they have to take, and it's computer-based tests, so it monopolized all the computers in the school, so they were no longer available for research. The library was shut down because you had to have a quiet testing uh, atmosphere, so kids could no longer go to the library. You use the library for learning for weeks on end three times a year, right? And so we, ref we decided to refuse, and despite the superintendent threatening us with a 10-day suspension without pay, because the PTA voted to support us and the student body government supported and the, and the boycott spread to seven other schools and uh, educators all over the country flooded the Seattle public schools with phone calls and emails in support of, of our testing boycott. At the end of the year, not only were none of the teachers reprimanded, but they got rid of the MAP test for Seattle's high schools altogether. It was, yeah. <laughs> It was a resounding victory, but again, it's just one of the 112, right? So we still have a long way to go. Um, and so refusing to give the tests is one, is one way to do it if you have enough teachers at your school. But uh, a movement that's truly become a mass movement across the country is the opt-out movement, where parents can opt their children out of the tests and starve these testing companies of the data that's being used to, to label and shame schools and withhold funding, right? And so uh, writing a, a letter, there's now a specific form letter in the Seattle Public Schools that you have to fill out that I recently did for my two sons. And you can opt your kids out of the test and join that movement. You can join uh, Rethinking Schools, um, and get our magazine and our books all about the history of standardized tests being introduced to the schools by um, eugenicists in the early uh, 1900s as an explicit movement of white supremacists uh, and learn how that history has been carried through to this day. And I'll just end by saying that um, while we were organizing the MAP test boycott, uh, I often said that we shouldn't give credit to Garfield's teachers for starting this boycott, that actually we should give the, the boycott credit to Bill Gates because <laughs> he never took these tests at Lakeside and he made sure his kids weren't inundated with 112 standardized tests. For his kids, he wanted the arts, he wanted huge libraries, Right? He wanted lots of time for critical thinking and reflecting on philosophy and literature. He didn't want to reduce the curriculum to what's on a multiple choice test and have kids every week of the year cramming knowledge into their head to memorize a few random bits of information to spit back on a test. He wanted his kids to have time to reflect Right? And, and to learn deeply. And that's what we want for all of our kids. So I hope you'll join that movement. All right. So thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Tim, for joining us, Steve, Jesse. Um, invite you to stick around, talk to any of the panelists. Um, Tim will be signing books, I believe. So get your copy and get it signed. And please also check out the um, AgriWatch CAGJ table where we have some cool um, resources um, and where yeah, you can just, learn more about the Gates Foundation's problematic funding of agricultural development. So. And thank you, Ashley, for emceeing. Woo!